the porn-obsessed father who murdered his wife and three sons and then killed himself left a note behind which seems to suggest he enjoyed the killings. Alan Ha, 40, killed his wife Cloda, 39, and sons Liam, 13, Neil, 11, and Ryan, 6, in August 2016 in Virginia and County Cavan, Ireland, before taking his own life. Cloda's family have spoken out to describe ex-murderer Ha as evil and rejected claims he was suffering from depression when he killed his wife and children. Now a letter he wrote, believed to have been penned between after the murder of his wife but before he cut his sleeping son's throats, has come to light. Ha writes, all the good stuff we did I was really into it. But I think there was some sort of psychosis that made me enjoy that yet in the next moment I was the complete opposite. I'm sorry for how I murdered them all but I simply had no other way. I'm sure I've gotten lots of what I wanted to say properly done badly. I know that Cloda and the boys would never be able to live their hopes and dreams if I had killed myself. I know I would only be sentencing Cloda to a life of misery. I know she would be strong but what of the boys in the future? I also didn't want them to be thought of less by people just cause of the way their father was. I know to many I was so nice to them but they never knew the real me. God bless you all. Don't give up on life cause of me. Be good to your families and I just don't know what it was that I was so normal yet so dark and no one could see it. People will probably tell you that I really could be a right PR. The victim's family, from whom the note was withheld by Irish police for 16 months, believe her wrote his note in two parts, starting it following the murder of his wife and finishing it after his sons were dead. It is believed he murdered his wife first as she sat on the settee in the sitting room of their home in Ireland, using an axe he kept in the shed and then. He then sat down at the kitchen table to write his murder-suicide letter which was sealed in an envelope. Afterwards, he took a second knife, this time a kitchen devil, and walked upstairs to attack his three sleeping sons. He returned downstairs, again took up his pen and, with the children dead in their beds, he wrote the additional words, which seemed to speak to his actions. On the outside of the envelope. Claude's mother and sister have spoken of their grief and anger, describing the force and deliberation of the killings. Her mother Mary Call said, That is evil. That is not depression. That is force brutality and it is control. Her mother Mary Call and sister Jacqueline Connolly told of the premeditated way Ha killed his family, slashing his son's throat so they couldn't cry out to alert each other and killing his wife and eldest sons first so they couldn't fight. Ms Connolly told Ritz Clower Byrne live last night, he was looking at pornography on the school laptop and he never brought the school laptop home. We've had sight of the counselling notes and he had said he was masturbating somewhere that he shouldn't have been, possibly at the school. M's call said, we do know now, that we didn't at the time, that he was dressing in Cloda's underwear. I mean Cloda would never, ever in her wildest dreams have thought of that, none of us would. We only found that out after the inquest. She added, if he was masturbating in the school well at the very least he was guilty of professional misconduct. That was at the very least. 
They also revealed Hassat and wrote a five-page letter and after hacking his wife to death with an axe and taking up a new weapon and launching another brutal attack on his sleeping sons upstairs, he transferred money. That is not depression. That is force brutality and it is control, M. Skull said. Speaking about the letter, she added, he kind of said that it was easier for them to die than to have to live with the truth of what he was doing. Lorda didn't know and it would be easier for her to die than to know the truth about him. M's call also revealed how hours before the murder, Ha had sat at her kitchen table with her daughter Gloda, drinking tea, eating biscuits and checking the lotto numbers while their young sons watched TV. Describing the night in question, M's call said, it was a normal conversation. He, Ha, was due back at work the next day and he didn't want to go back. Myself and Cloda and Alan sat in the kitchen and we chatted normally and we, had, coffee and tea and biscuits or whatever. When they left we hugged, we said I love you, we always did that, and I said to Alan, I said good luck tomorrow and we said thanks Mary, thanks for the goodies and I never saw them again. She said the next morning when she didn't hear from her daughter she knew something was wrong. M's call said, I drove up to the house and I saw the curtains all drawn and the two cars and I thought there is something terrible wrong. I had a key to their back door and I ran round the back and I had the key in my hand and I saw the note on the door. And it read don't come in, call the guardy. And I knew it was his writing. And I went out on the road and I let the phone fall and I tried to dial 999 about 10 times but I couldn't. Eventually I got through and I went to Cloda's neighbor and I said to her Edie, I said, I think Alan has done something terrible. She said Gloda had been enjoying a cup of tea on the couch and looking up holidays online when Ha struck her with an axe. M's call said, he came in behind her and he hit her in the head with the axe and he stabbed her in the back and she put up her hand to defend herself and he basically nearly sawed her hand off. He killed her like he hated her. He didn't need to use two weapons. He killed her with such brutality. M's call said he then took up a new knife and went upstairs where he put his knee on his eldest son Liam's chest and cut through his windpipe to render him silent. She said, so Neil was sharing a room with Liam's own Neil probably wouldn't have woken up because Liam couldn't scream out but he had defensive wounds on his hands. He did the same to Neil and then he went to Ryan's room. Ryan was the smallest of the three of them. He was very slight and thin for his age but during the inquest we were told that he used a sawing action on Ryan and that he just threw the duvet cover over all of them and left the knife that he used on Ryan's pillow. That is not depression. That is force brutality and it is control. Gloda, Ha and the boys were initially buried together. Gloda's sister Jacqueline Conley said it was only the day after the funeral when they visited the graves that they realized. We were initially told it would be no problem to have him moved but then we realized that the exhumation could not happen, unless, Alan Hawes next of kin applied for him to be moved. So we asked the Haw family. She said that eventually his family agreed. M's call and Jacqueline have called for a fresh, full inquiry into the four murders. 
They want Garda Commissioner Drew Harris to set up an investigation unit for familicide and family annihilation. An inquest heard Ha had severe mental illness. But M's call said when she heard that she wanted to shout from the rooftops, that's not the truth, that's not what happened. She said, Alan Ha was attending his GP for five years and she didn't diagnose him with depression. We just feel that people need to be aware of the truth and that is the truth. We need the truth, Claude Ha's family lay bare the horror of how she and her three children were murdered and the awful aftermath in a spine-chilling interview. On August 29, 2016, Alan Ha murdered his wife Gloda and their children Liam, Neil and Ryan. In last night's exclusive interview with Gloda's mother Mary Call and sister Jacqueline Connolly, presenter Clara Byrne asked about the night before the killing. Claire, I know this is really difficult but on the 28th August, they were in their house Mary, isn't that right? Mary, that's right yes. Claire, and you were having a cup of tea together and this was all normal. Do you want to talk to me about that evening? Mary, that evening, Liam had a basketball match in Virginia that evening so they were all going to it. They came to my house after the match for a cup of tea. Probably around half past six, seven o'clock, I'm not sure of the time. But the children sat and they watched Tully and they had whatever. Poor little Ryan had a bag of crisps, his favorite salt and vinegar, and myself and Gloda and Alan sat in the kitchen and we chatted normally and we had coffee and tea and biscuits or whatever and he googled stuff on the phone for me, the lotto numbers, the plowing championship, when it was on. We talked about everything and anything. Claire, and it was a normal conversation? Mary, it was a normal conversation. He was due back at work the next day and he didn't want to go back. So at 22.9, Claudia looked at the clock and she said, Alan we better go home now because Ryan has to have a bath. Ryan and Neil didn't have school so they were coming to me and we were going to pick blackberries and we were going, Neil was going to make blackberry and apple crumble. When they left we hugged, we said, I love you, we always did that, and I said to Alan, I said, good luck tomorrow and he said thanks Mary. Thanks for the goodies and I never saw them again. Claire, okay, take your time, take your time. Mary, that was the last time I ever saw them. Mary, I sat the next morning and I waited for Claude to drop the boys off and I looked out the window and I sat down and I got up and I kept thinking, what is wrong? Because of Cloda, if she was going to be five minutes late, she'd let you know. I rang her phone, there was no reply. I rang the house phone. I rang his phone. I text him, where is Chloe? She hasn't arrived yet and eventually, I don't know how long had passed, I got into the car but at that stage my stomach was sick, I knew. I drove over that road, it was the longest journey I ever drove, and it was only 5 miles, and I remember seeing the magpies on the road. And I said, please God, don't let anybody else be dead. And I drove up to the house and I saw the curtains all drawn and the two cars and I thought there is something terribly wrong. And then I thought maybe it's carbon monoxide poisoning, the five of them couldn't have slept in. 
So I had a key to their back door and I ran round the back and I had the key in my hand and I was just about to put it in the lock and I looked and I saw the note on the door. And it read, don't come in, call the guardy. And I knew it was his writing. And I went out on the road and I let the phone fall and I tried to dial 999 about 10 times but I couldn't. Eventually I got through and I went to Clota's neighbor and I said to her, Edie. I think Alan has done something terrible. And she said to me what, Mary? I said, I don't know but I think he's done something terrible. And the two of us went round to the back door and she said to me, Mary, please don't go in and I said, no, Edie, I'm not going to go in because I knew, I just knew. In the pit of my stomach, I just knew that if I went in, I would never be able to live again. And the guards came, two guards came, and they told me to go into Edie's house and stay with Edie and I don't know how long I was there and eventually they came in and they just stood there. The male guard said to me, we found five bodies, there's nobody alive. Jacqueline, it was actually coming in on my phone before I got to ma'am, five found dead and caven but no one could tell me how they died. We know now that he killed Claude first, we know now from the inquest that he killed the people first that would be deemed well able to stand up to him. The axe that he killed Claude with was always kept in the shed outside so we know that at some stage before the time that he killed Claude he had brought it into the house. He had already moved the furniture that Claude would have her back to him as he walked into the sitting room. We know that Claude was online looking up holidays at the time and she was having a cup of tea. He came in behind her and he hit her in the head with the axe and he stabbed her in the back and she put up her hand to defend herself and he basically nearly sawed her hand off. He killed her like he hated her. He didn't need to use two weapons, he killed her with such brutality, it was evil. He, from what it would seem. He then sat down and he wrote the letter because he had left the axe and the knife on the floor and he wrote the letter and he took up a new knife and he went upstairs and he, we know he put his knee on Liam's chest and cut through his windpipe to render him silent so Neil was sharing a room with Liam so Neil probably wouldn't have woken up because Liam couldn't scream out but he had defensive wounds on his hands. did the same to Neil and then he went to Ryan's room. Ryan was the smallest of the three of them, he was very slight and thin for his age but during the inquest we were told that he used a sawing action on Ryan and that he just threw the duvet cover over all of them and left the knife that he used on Ryan's pillow. That is not depression. That is force brutality and it is control. Jacqueline, there was no initial support. I remember the Monday myself and ma'am trying to contact people and there was nobody there. There was no initial person with us on the day to say, you know, this has happened and take time or anything like that. Seeing things online, we were ringing our family a liaison officer at one point to say, please tell me he didn't kill her with an axe. So it was the media that was informing us more so than anybody else initially. Two weeks before the inquest we got a copy of his letter which was 16 months after it happened so from what we can see from reading the letter he had initially during the summer, he had moved the furniture, he had moved the couch from a side wall in the sitting room to have the back of it facing that Lorda wouldn't find him coming behind her. 
It had never been moved in the 12 years that they had been living there but it had been moved when they came back from holidays. Reading the letter it would seem that he killed Claude I and he sat and he wrote five pages about how he felt, and how the truth was going to come out eventually and he reassured us that if it was any consolation that they were happy. He then killed the boys and he came downstairs then and he wrote some more. And then he transferred money and he went about his business while his family were dead around him and he set out folders and wrote notes. There, just when you say he transferred money, just explain what you mean by that. Jacqueline, at about half two that morning, he transferred about negation 2,500 from the joint account to his own account so at that point he was a criminal and then he was fraudulently transferring money. And then he obviously put the note on the back door and he laid Gloda's jewelry on the bed upstairs. Claire, and he said in that note that he wanted you, Mary, to have the jewelry.